We are studying the book of Acts in our morning worship and we come to the second half of chapter 9 following the conversion of Saul on the Damascus Road. We read from the 18th verse, you remember he's now in the house of Ananias uh, in Damascus and he has been blinded by his uh, vision of Christ on the Damascus Road. Acts chapter 9 and verse 18 and immediately something like scales fell from Saul's eyes and he regained his sight and then he rose and was baptized and took food and was strengthened. For several days uh, he was with the disciples at Damascus and in the synagogues immediately he proclaimed Jesus the man of Nazareth the human name saying he is the son of God and all who heard him were amazed and said is not this the man who made havoc in Jerusalem of those who called on this name and he has come here for this purpose to bring them bound before the chief priests but Saul increased all the more in strength and confounded the Jews who lived in Damascus by proving that Jesus the human name the human man that Jesus was the Christ or the Messiah. When many days had passed, the Jews plotted to kill him, but their plot became known to Saul. They were watching the gates day and night to kill him. But uh, his disciples took him by night and let him down over the wall, lowering him in a basket. And when he had come to Jerusalem, he attempted to join the disciples and they were all afraid of him for they did not believe that he was a disciple but Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles and declared to them how on the road he had seen the Lord who spoke to him and how at Damascus he had preached boldly in the name of Jesus. And so he went in and out among them at Jerusalem, preaching boldly in the name of the Lord, and he spoke and disputed amongst the Hellenists, <coughs> that to say Jews from the empire, not who lived in Palestine. The Jews who lived outside Palestine would be really Jews who spoke Greek, and they were called the Hellenists. And Saul spoke and disputed amongst the Hellenists, <clears throat> but they were seeking to kill him. And when the brethren knew it, they brought him down to Caesarea and sent him off to Tarsus. And so the church throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria had peace and was built up and uh, walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, it, the church, was multiplied. <clears throat> Amen. And God will add his own blessing to the reading from his word and give us an understanding of it. Amen. You will uh, recall that the first half of Acts chapter 9 is taken up with the conversion of Saul on the Damascus Road. The second half of this chapter deals with the apparent unwillingness of the Jerusalem church to accept the man as a true disciple of Jesus Christ. You see this unwillingness hinted at in Ananias, way up in Damascus, and uh, when he was told that Saul had been converted, his first reaction was to protest to the Lord. And he said, Saul, 
converted. There must be some kind of a mistake. This man, a Christian, this man who used to be an enemy of the gospel and who killed the followers of Jesus Christ, this man saved. I really can't take that in. And that was Ananias' reaction to the news that Saul had become a real Christian. And this same sort of reserve and caution marked Saul's reception in the Jerusalem church. And the Christians there were unwilling to believe that he was converted at all. And so came the cold shoulder and then the grudging acceptance of this new man. And that sort of thing has always been found in the Church of Christ throughout the years. There have always been unwelcoming churches and unwelcoming Christians, uh, suspicious of anything new and not quite sure how to handle outsiders and not terribly ready to believe that so-and-so is a true believer and worthy to be taken into the fellowship. And I think this attitude of non-welcome that you find in many churches is due to two wrong views and attitudes. And I want to think about these two wrong views and attitudes this morning. The first is a wrong view of the death of Christ and of the basic message of the gospel. It's the view that expresses itself when a man in his heart thinks like this. I believe that Christ died for sinners but not for awful sinners. Or, to put it another way, I believe that Christ died for the likes of me, but not for the likes of him or the likes of her. And in Christian circles, I have found that attitude to be quite common. The attitude that Jesus is capable of saving certain kinds of sinner. But there are other sinners who are beyond the pale of Jesus Christ. Now, let me be quite frank with you <clears throat> this morning. I don't mean to be intentionally offensive. But uh, listen to this. In my private pastoral work as a minister in these past 11 years, I have had dealings with the following people. A man who enjoyed beating his wife. One girl and several men with deep, erotic and deviant sexual problems. A housewife who had been involved in prostitution for the sake of money. Several men who stole from their employers. Several men who were guilty of blasphemy against God. Many men who swore uncontrollably. Countless alcoholics or people with alcohol problems, a ceaseless flow of men and women whose sole concerns were for this world. They were ruthlessly interested in money and success and advancement and promotion. 
They were interested only in this world's values and this world's esteem. Now, if I were to ask you to draw up a list of these sins and set them in some kind of order of priority, <coughs> putting the most heinous and the most objectionable sins at the top of your list, what would your list look like? Would you put the sexual deviation at the top? Or the violence within marriage? Or the thievery? Or the prostitution? What would your list look like? And supposing that I lined up all these men and women in church this morning and asked them to speak frankly to you about what they once had been. And supposing I were to tell you that all these people are now soundly converted to Christ and thoroughly saved and serving the Lord. Would you accept them? Would you give them a welcome? Or would you treat them as the Jerusalem church treated Saul with suspicion and a large slice of cold shoulder? It's a healthy corrective to read the Bible and to see the sort of men and women who came to Christ in the Roman Empire. Listen to this list of the sort of folk who made up the Christians in Corinth. Do you not know, says Paul writing to them, that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? And I suppose we can all say amen to that. Everybody knows that the unrighteous will not inherit God's kingdom. Do not be deceived. Neither the immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor sexual perverts, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor robbers will inherit the kingdom of God full stop. And we can all say amen to that, can't we? And the next sentence is, and such were some of you. This is what you used to be like. But you have been washed. <clears throat> you have been sanctified. You have been justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the Spirit of our God. <clears throat> A motley crew, my friends, <clears throat> and not quite the run-of-the-mill parish church Sabbath morning congregation, is it? Would you welcome these people here today? Would they feel at home in our fellowship? Or do you find yourself saying in your heart this morning, well, Christ died to save sinners, and I believe he died to save sinners like me, but he did not die to save sinners like them. I was at the Scottish Evangelical Society Conference down in Carronvale this week, listening to um, Professor James Torrance and um, old prophet Ronnie Wallace and Professor George Yule. And we were arguing as to whether any Christian had the right to go up to any man in the street and say to him, Jesus died for you. And after a lot of argument and toing and throwing, most of us agreed that no Christian has any warrant to go up to any man in the street and say, Jesus died 
for you. So we started arguing as to what we could say to any man in the street. And the best suggestion was this. Jesus died for a sinner like you. And you can say that to everyone in the world. Thieves and robbers and worldlings and wife beaters and sexual deviants and all. Jesus died for a sinner like you. Here is how General Booth of the Salvation Army put it in his Founder's Song. It used to be song number one in the old Salvation Army hymn book. Now General Booth, you know, was a Methodist lay preacher before he founded the Salvation Army. And he was reacting to a wrong kind of, of Calvinism, which he saw in his day, a kind of Drich, doer Calvinism that didn't offer anybody much hope. So he wrote his hymn. And this is the first verse of his hymn. O oh, boundless salvation, deep ocean of love, O oh, fullness of mercy Christ brought from above, the whole world redeeming, so rich and so free, now flowing for all men. Come, roll over me. And Charles Wesley, the early Methodist, put it in exactly the same way. He too was reacting against the, the dead, severe Calvinism in the churches. And in his great hymn, Jesus, the name high over all, you get this verse. Oh, that the world might taste and see the riches of his grace, the arms of love that compass me. Would all mankind embrace? Not to believe that is to have a wrong view of the death of Christ and a wrong view of the message of grace. And it was this wrong view that drove the Jerusalem church to give this outsider Saul the cold shoulder. Is there anyone here this morning with a wrong view of the death of Christ? Are you saying in your heart, well, I believe that Jesus died for sinners. I believe Jesus died for me. But I don't believe that Jesus died for the likes of them. Secondly, the exclusion of Saul meant there was a wrong view of the church amongst these Christians in Jerusalem. Now, I spoke to you about this conference we had at Caron Vale this past week. And in the course of the conference, we were speaking about what is called in Latin the Ordo Salutis, which simply means the order of salvation, the order of events, when a sinner comes to Christ. Now, what happens when a sinner comes to Christ? What is the pattern and order of events? What is the Ordo Salutis? How do you become a Christian? Well, the most famous instance of the Ordo Salutis is John Bunyan's book called Grace Abounding to the Chief of Sinners. And every Christian ought to read that book because it's John Bunyan's testimony. It's the story of his life and it is a classical conversion story. Grace abounding to the chief of sinners. And here is the Ordo Salutis in Bunyan's book. Stage one. I was brought up in a good home with good religious parents 
and they taught me to pray and to read the Bible, but stage two, I fell into sin, I fell away from God, I started drinking and beating my wife, and so on. Then, stage three, I saw Jesus dying for me, and I had an evangelical experience of him. I turned from my sins, and I was born again, and so I am now in stage four, I'm on the road home to glory. Now, that is a classical statement of the Ordo Salutis, and a good deal of modern evangelism is built on that. This is how to get saved. Stage one, I used to be brought up in the right way. Stage two, I fell away from God and was lost. Stage three, I saw Jesus Christ and I was born again. Stage four, now I am rejoicing on my way home to glory. And that's the Ordo Salutis. And many people come to Christ that way. Um, I'm not ashamed to tell you that I came to Christ through that order of salvation. And most of my friends became Christians in that way. But that doesn't mean that this is the only way to come to Christ. And believing that this is the only way to come to Christ has led in the Christian church to the non-welcome for those who have not been through that process. Let me be quite clear about this. Professor James Torrance of Aberdeen was, was speaking. This is what he said. We were speaking about coming to Christ. He said, one thing is absolutely certain. Unless you come to Christ, you will never be saved. That's absolutely true, because you cannot be saved outside Christ. If you are outside Christ, or if you decide that you want to go on staying outside Christ, then you'll be lost. And if you stay like that, you'll be lost forever. And therefore, your first duty is to come to Christ. And it's at that point that the Scottish mind, which has been bred on the Ordo Salutis, and the Highland mind, that has been bred on the Ordo Salutis, the order of salvation, start to protest and say, oh, but that's too open, you see. That's too free. You're giving too much away by asking people to come to Jesus like this. What about repentance? What about conviction of sin? What about a sense of the holiness of God? Don't you see, my friend, if these are the things that you think about, you will never come to Christ. You'll be looking at yourself all the time. Have I repented? Is, is my conviction deep enough? Am I aware of my sin? Have I seen God's holiness? If you keep on looking at yourself and your own fitness and your own worthiness, you will never come to Christ. But if you look at him and come to him, then you'll have a sense of sin and of repentance and an awareness of the holiness of God. It is absolutely essential, said James Stewart, that you come to Jesus Christ just as you are. If you had a free hand with the church notice board, which isn't there, high time it was there, it's been missing for too long, what would you put up? Keep out Or welcome. Let me show you this from John Gordon, who passed to his rest yesterday morning. Good man. He's a grand soul, if you knew him. Very kind, 
generous man. And last Sabbath communion, John went upstairs, for he never felt he was worthy enough to come to the Lord's Supper. You know the healing thing. And he said to my brother Ian, who was on duty, John had a great sense of humor. His eyes were sparkling, he said, as he climbed the stairs, were I want to join the heathen today. And of course, he was very far from a heathen, but he was a God-fearing man. He loved the word, a great listener, and possessed of a deep knowledge of the scriptures. At the end of the communion service last Sunday morning, he patted me on the shoulder as he went downstairs, and he said, Great stuff! Mind you, many members didn't say that, which is a bit solemn, maybe. Great stuff. It would pay many folk here today if they knew their Bibles as well as John Gordon. And I no more believe that all the people who sit upstairs are heathens than I believe that all who sit downstairs are Christians. Many people who come to the Lord's Supper are not Christians. They're just pagans. You can tell by their lives. They're just pagans. Materialists and worldlings. Not interested in Christ at all. Whether you sit upstairs or downstairs, whether you are an adherent or an unbelieving church member, the invitation is the same. Your primary duty is to come to Jesus Christ. Not to stay away or keep out or anything of that. But welcome. And at the end of the day, the Jerusalem church did take him in. And I think Paul never forgot the welcome because there's an awful lot about it in his letters. Listen to these words, Romans 15. Welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you. That's pretty fully, isn't it? Welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. Philippians 2 uh, writing to the church in, in Philippi and speaking to them about a chap called Epaphras who was going to visit them. And Epaphras was an unknown quantity to the Christians in Philippi. And Paul said, Receive him in the Lord with all joy and honor such men. Colossians 4, writing about young Mar Mark, who, remember, was a bit of a washout because he had deserted Paul in the middle of the first missionary journey. He just, he couldn't stand it. He wasn't a born missionary. He just couldn't stand the toughness of being a Christian missionary. And so he abandoned Paul in Asia Minor and was a great heartbreak to Paul. But what does Paul say in Colossians 4? And Mark, if he comes to you, receive him. Welcome. And lastly, in Philemon, verse 15, you remember there was a slave called Onesimus, and he'd run away from his master, and in the years of his running away, he had become a Christian. And so Paul is now sending this Christian slave, Onesimus, back to his master. This is what he says, writing to Philemon, well, he says, perhaps this is why he was parted from you for a while. <laughs> Putting it very gently, he ran away. Why he was parted from you for a while. That you might have him back forever. Receive him as you would receive me. Our work as Christians is to cultivate that warmth of welcome. Not, oh, Jesus died for the likes of me, but Jesus didn't die for the likes of them. Not that. It's a wrong view of the death of Christ. It's a wrong view of the church. Not the sour look and the frosty face. Not the, 
keep out of our religious club pose. But the attitude that says, come and welcome to Jesus Christ. Amen, and may the Lord add a blessing to the preaching of his word, to his name, be honor and praise.